The days of French colonization are long gone. From Senegal to the Central African Republic, the French colonies are sovereign and independent. Yet, the country's brutal terrain of land expansion still exists with its overseas territories. Outside of Europe, the former colonial empire has grasped over 13 territories. And one of them is the quintessential name in international law textbooks, Clipperton Island. Some also refer to the island as the Passion Island or the Medanos. Located 1,120 kilometers southwest of Mexico and the only atoll in the eastern Pacific Ocean, the island is uninhabited, remote and infested with rats. But even the 19th century ruin has compelled one of the most durable territorial disputes between France and Mexico. Today, the island is governed by the colonial ministry of the overseas of France, under French Polynesia. But that wasn't always the case. So, join us as we historically outline the case of Clipperton Island. Before we move on, make sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell. Let's get started. Now, there isn't any reason for you to visit the island. You'd think, under French control, the island would be rehabilitated to protect its highly diverse biodiversity and the interiorized Blue Lagoon. But the reality couldn't have been far from it. First things first, the island doesn't even have a harbor. If anything, you'd need to cover a 700-mile distance on the boat to even get the sight of the island. But there's no guarantee that it would be a safe voyage. One hindrance would be the bed of coral reefs that makes up most of the underwater ecosystem around Clipperton Island. As the island is protected from human intervention, it has still held on to its ecological markups. It's the home to moray eels and epidemic fishes. But that's just the good news. The island is also infested with sharks in its border and rats on its land. For a far-flung piece of land, it's a little difficult to incentivize anyone to get rid of that problem. To be fair, the island is in ruins. The only identifiable infrastructure on the island are the remains of a 19th century lighthouse and a tuna fishing station. By all accounts, that's one tropical island where you wouldn't want to spend your vacations. What you don't know is that before Clipperton was caught up in a territorial dispute and waves of invasion, it was the land of the pirates. And if there's one thing that pirates do at the island, is that they hide their treasures. And the Passion Island is no different. This is where Clipperton Island becomes significant in modern history. This is also, incidentally, where it finds its widely known name. When John Clipperton, an English pirate and privateer, started a mutiny against William Dampier during the War of Spanish Succession, his base was the Passion Island. The island had taken its name from the time it was discovered by two French voyagers who stumbled upon it during the Passion Tide. As the charmer's luck, the Frenchmen named their discovery the Passion Island under the banner of their country's official territory in 1711. It's unclear if John Clipperton knew of the French discovery or not, but he did use the island as his base to launch multiple raids of Dampier. In the process, he's known to bury a treasure somewhere on the island. And centuries later, it still hasn't been found. Now it makes sense why the island takes its modern moniker from the surname of its most recent discoverer. Before the French discovery of Clipperton, the island had been discovered at least 183 years ago. And historical records show that the first human encounter is actually attributed to the Spanish conquistador, Hernan Cortes, who was based in modern-day Mexico. Here's where the ownership rights to the island get tangled up. We know Cortes as the man who ended Mexico's Triple Alliance or the Aztec Empire. The conquistador then proceeded to buy most of the Mexican territory. As he had commissioned the first voyage to the unnamed island, he had declared the discovery an extension to Mexican territory he had bought. This was the year 1582. Now, here's the thing. In the time of Hernan Cortes, the modern idea of territoriality and preserving sovereignty for states and their borders didn't exist. There was no United Nations to recognize Mexico's right to the island that its Spanish ruler had uncovered. What we can rely on is the idea of owning a land or territoriality in principle. There wasn't any globally recognized mechanism to make a land sovereign. So it mostly came down to who discovered the land first or deployed its army. The problem is, both Mexico and France had recognized its ownership of the Clipperton Island in principle. At the end of the day, it became the matter of whose claim to the territory was widely recognized and accepted. Before Mexico and France could make their territorial dispute a matter of international law, the corporate interest in the US had already made rounds of the island. 
So, the dispute itself actually doesn't start from Europe or South America. It actually finds its roots in the Guano Islands Act of 1856. The federal law had enabled the US citizens to explore and take control of the unclaimed lands rich with guano. As long as they declared the land as the asset of the state and waved the American flag, of course. Even today, the Guano Act recognizes at least 10 islands as the property of the United States. One island that isn't in the list but fits the description was Clipperton Island, who wasn't only just visually unclaimed, but it was also protected from any human activities or settlements. It didn't take long for the Stonington and Ocean Phosphate companies of the US to set their eyes on their next big prized possession. But of course, the US State Department had taken note of the French claim over the Passion Island. It's a little complicated to trace if the US wasn't aware of the Mexican claim over an outpost far-flung island in the Pacific, especially in the light of the Mexican-American War that had ended in 1848. It makes more diplomatic sense for the US to identify one claim over the other. By then, the State Department gave a red light to both Stonington and Oceanic for Clipperton Island. Both of their claims were denied, and the state asked them to continue their search in spirit of the US economy. But the riches of Clipperton were too glorious to ignore. It was an allegedly untouched and untapped island in the territory that had no virtual human population whatsoever. Who wouldn't want to kickstart an economic extraction there? This was the thought process of the Oceanic Phosphate Company when it started mining guano in the island without the official state approval. Sure, it could have gotten away because its home country had no stations on the island. Until in 1897, the French naval missions caught the wind of three Americans who were getting started with the preliminary process of the guano extraction. And of course, they had only gotten part of the guano act right. They made sure to wave off the American flag. Now, that could have gone downhill because France was insistent upon its claim for the island. The US had to assure the French government that their sovereignty doesn't extend to Clipperton Island and that it recognizes its rightful owner, France. That's one way to avoid another territorial dispute, but oh well, only to start another one. But back then, the word rightful was subjective, because Mexico had also claimed the islands one of its territories. As the Passion Island was more into the Mexican waters, it almost seemed natural for the country to declare the islands as one of its own. Yet, if there's anything the French colonial doctrine has thought, is that its control extends far beyond European borders too. So, why would Clipperton be any different? And Mexico took initiative. By 1897, it had established a military base on the island, drawing up to gunboat diplomacy. The message was clear. The Clipperton is under Mexican right, and the country won't hesitate to use its military might to assert its control. Soon enough, the Americans were evicted from the island, and it became obvious that Mexicans would be giving the British rightful access to the island for mining guano. In totality, that was a defeat for the US, but even more so for France. Previously, the country had taken no interest in the island largely due to its difficult terrain and poor quality guano. What Mexico knew was that France didn't have any recorded activity on the island in recent history. So, the Mexican militarized occupation of the island continued till 1931. Between 1897 and 1909, a series of robust diplomatic interventions brought both countries to agree for an arbitration through the Vatican. In 1930, the Vatican decided to outsource the sole decider of the arbitration and its chosen arbitrator was King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy. And in the making of this hundred-year-old territorial dispute, the arbitration took 22 years. You heard that right, 22 years. In the process, both countries asked to present a case for their ownership. Mexico's entire case was contingent upon the case of Spanish explorers that were commissioned by Hernán Cortés. The issue with the claim was the lack of any record of Mexico declaring Clipperton as one of its own territory. They also made grounds for considering their 1897 legal and valid jurisdiction because the French hadn't even deployed their flag on the island. For what it's worth, the French had a similar problem. Or at least, it seemed like it. And the Mexican government made sure to protest about that as well. Most of it will go in vain after France presents its case in Italy, and actually pulls up a documented record. The government of France made three arguments in the court of Victor Emmanuel III. First, it had encountered the island again in 1858 under the rule of Napoleon III. 
Secondly, the king had also commissioned French Lieutenant Victor Lecot de Curvegu in a merchant ship to declare French sovereignty over the island. And lastly, and more importantly, the Ministry of French Foreign Affairs had notified its latest procurements in Polynesian newspaper, making it to be an official proof of recordation. Today, a newspaper won't be even admissible as a proof for territoriality, let alone to decide the fate of an island. But for France, it came in handy in 1931, when the King of Italy officially announced his decision on the arbitration raised two decades ago. After winning the rights to the territory, the French decided to make a military post on the island, only to abandon it within seven years. There has been more robust development in the legislation of territorial disputes and overseas sovereignty. You have intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations that have appropriate measures to arbitrate these issues. Even when the Clipperton Island lives under French sovereignty, it is widely disputed and debated in international law. Yet the 100-year dispute surely makes us wonder what was so strategic about this island that it has had four cases of state intervention from France, Mexico, the US and Britain. Well, we have two words for you. Guanomania. Who knew bird droppings would kick off a series of territorial disputes and even a small scare genocide in the island? There's only a semi-useful resource on the Clipperton Island, guano. The accumulated feces of seabirds transformed into a strain of fertilizers that's rich in nitrogen, phosphate and potassium. For a world that was looking for intensive food production methods to keep up with a growing economy and an expanding population, guano was nothing short of a resource blessing. Before the cracking of the Haber process that made production of ammonia easy, the mania for guano produced an entire age of resource colonization. Believe it or not, many imperial powers, such as the US and Britain, sought Gano even if it meant by force, or extending the jurisdiction of their territories. We have already talked about the Guano Island Act of the US. But in the case of the Clipperton, it's the British imperialism and colonial rule that wiped away the human population on the island. And the story is reflective of early British ambitions of curbing down the US hegemony over resources that were useful for its industrial revolution ambitions. When the island was under Mexico's gunboat control, it gave the British Pacific Island Company to extract guano. Now, any state-level extraction process doesn't happen without labor, right? That's when Mexico aided the British in popularizing the island by locating its citizens to the island via Acapulco. And the lighthouse was built, the same lighthouse that is now in ruins on the island even today. What you don't know is that it tells a story of genocide, mass murder and assault. By 1914, there were 100 people living on the island. The series of regional violence in Mexico erupted into the full-blown revolution. As the country went deep into the Mexican Revolution, the residents of Clipperton stopped getting food and water supplies. Even when there was a chance for people to leave the island via an American ship, the government of Mexico called it an unnecessary evacuation. It assured the residents that they'll receive timely supplies. But the intense unrest during the revolution meant that the only route to Clipperton would be blocked. This negligence meant that within three years, the entire population would die of scurvy or in a desperate attempt to board a passing ship, except for 16 people. In 1917, 15 women and children, as well as the keeper of the lighthouse, Victoriano Alvarez. For Alvarez, the question of survival was turned into a sheer sense of megalomania and control. He declared himself the king of the island, and his subjects were only 15 survivors of Mexican-British cruelty. What happens next is the biggest tragedy of the island. Alvarez started a series of murders and assaults on the women of the island. When the help didn't come for the subjects of the self-proclaimed king, they decided to take matters into their own hands. The victor of this story is Tirza Rendon, who plotted the murder of their king with other women. It's narrated that Rendon was Alvarez's most tortured victim, and he frequently subjected his monstrosity on her. The collision was successful in getting rid of the cruel king, but their own survival wasn't guaranteed. Until, coincidentally, they were saved by the passing US Navy gunship Yorktown in the same year. After the French abandoned the island, there haven't been any attempts to further colonize Clipperton. 
In the late 1930s, Franklin D. Roosevelt showed keen interest in making the island a strategic trans-Pacific airbase. And he nearly did. But the end to World War II meant that the US had to de-radicalize its mission to militarize any occupied territories. Today, the site of mass murder and genocide just stands as the symbol of a hundred-year territorial dispute between France and Mexico. Enjoyed this video? Give it a big thumbs up, subscribe to our channel for more informative content, and share this video with your friends. See you soon!